Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps For the good man, someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask today as we continue to look into your word that you would open our eyes to help us see wondrous things from your word. Lord, I pray that you would incline our hearts to your word. Give us a desire to know it and to live it. Lord, I pray that you would unify our minds so we would not be distracted by the many things that could tempt us away from the message you have for us today. And Lord, we pray that you would satisfy our desires as we just sang, dear Lord. That what we crave the most, what we desire the most, where we seek our refuge in times of trouble would be in you, our refuge and strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this next talk is entitled, Exalting in Tribulations. And it comes from verse three that we just read, and and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. That's crazy talk. (laughs) Who does that? One of the first things that we do when people come into counseling is we, we ask them what they hope to achieve in counseling, right? If you've done counseling for any amount of time, that's one of the questions. If you've been in biblical counseling for a while, you might have heard something called a PDI or personal data inventory or some people don't like that very technical terminology and they're like, let's just get to know one another. Whatever you do, one of the things you ask is, what is your goal in counseling? What do you hope to achieve? What are your expectations and desired outcomes? So when Carl, our friend who is the wounded Marine, comes in for counseling, what do you think he's coming in counseling for? He knows that we can't make his leg or his fingers grow back. He knows that apart from serious advances in medical technology, his hearing is never going to be fully restored or the same as it was before. But somehow, when he comes to counseling, his, his expectations are some, something like this. You are going to fix his problems. You're going to help him deal with all the mental problems and difficulties he's having. With. He's hoping that you're going to take away his nightmares. That you're going to lift him out of depression. You're going to take away the thoughts of suicide. You're going to fix his marriage and help his kids love him again. You're going to help him stop self-medicating through alcohol or drugs. And you're hoping that, he's hoping that you're going to remove the guilt that he feels about certain things that he did while he was in combat that were in conflict with his conscience. He's hoping that you're going to fix his soul. Can you fix Carl's soul? Is that what the goal of biblical counseling is? Is that what the goal of biblical counseling should be? 
These are tough questions and these are important questions for us to answer and the question really comes down to what is it that Carl is hoping for? And what, is, what should Carl be hoping for? Before I answer those questions specifically, uh, and the question we're gonna look at is, is what should we hope for and what should we hope in? We're gonna continue to give ourselves more ammunition of things that we can hope in to build the hope during the trials and sufferings that come along our way. But it's important that we understand and define what we mean by suffering and, and give ourselves a good biblical theology of suffering. Now, thankfully, in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of writing and, and people thinking about a theology of suffering. I think they're reacting against some, some trends in theology that were, and in culture that were just pushing us away from even thinking about hard things. And I won't be able to exhaust everything that can be said about suffering and how we should see suffering, but I want to give us some, some important things that we must understand when it comes to suffering. So what do we mean when we say there, somebody is suffering? <clears throat> There's actually a number of different definitions that Merriam-Webster's dis- dictionary gives, but as an, as an intransitive verb, suffering can be described as enduring death, pain, or distress. To sustain loss or damage, or to be subject to disability or handicap. There's lots of words that we use to describe suffering. There's suffering, trial, tribulation, distress, hardship, victims, bear up, understand, endure, pain, and the list could probably go on and on and on. And what this, this tells us is that suffering is common. I, I, again, grew up in the, the southwestern United States, so when I think of north of the border, I think Arizona, Texas, New Mexico. Um, not what you're used to thinking. So snow was not a huge thing that I grew up in, but you, you guys are familiar that in, in regions of the world, like Canada, Alaska, that native people have a lot of different words for snow, to describe the different types of snow. I'm living in a place now where it snows and my boys and I are learning there are two types of snow. Snow that is good for making snowballs and snow that is not good for making snowballs. (laughs) My boys were born in Arizona and California, you know, central California. They don't know anything about snow. My my four-year-old actually said, Dad, I'm really excited for when it snows in Kentucky because then the penguins will come out. He was really disappointed. <laughs> but the idea is that, that we can create a lot of words for things that we're familiar with. When, the, when we are around something all the time, we come up with lots and lots and lots of words for it, and that's why we have so many words for suffering. Because the trials and the tribulations and the difficulties that come into life will come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There's gonna be lectures or talks that happen later on this week that will focus on suffering that we inflict on ourselves, suffering that, that comes because of the consequences of our own sin. And then there's suffering that comes because of somebody else's sin against us. And then there's just suffering because we live in a sinful, fallen world. And creation is groaning and accidents happen and hurricanes destroy and natural disasters erupt all over. And we suffer. They're just the natural consequences of getting old and aging and getting sick. So there's lots of different ways in which we suffer and and the beauty of scripture is that it doesn't just address any particular one or two or three or four forms of suffering, it addresses all of them. And the crazy thing is that Paul here tells us we can exalt in our tribulations. We can exult, we can boast, we can rejoice in the hardships and the suffering that we face. But this is impossible to do if we don't understand what suffering is really about. So the reason Paul says that we can exult in our suffering is is what it does what it accomplishes. We're not masochists. We don't endure and exalt in the the suffering and tribulation for the sake of pain. No, he says that we exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint 
because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. This is not a, not a theme that is only familiar to Paul. James in James chapter one says what? Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter trials of various kinds. They had a crazy exalting and tribulation club that James and Paul got together and just talked about how awesome hardship was. I don't, I, I don't actually know if James and Paul ever met, but the, the reality is that both of them cover this idea because it's a truth that God has given to us. We understand the fruit of suffering is what we're after, not the suffering in and of itself. And in Romans, Paul continues, as I mentioned before, Romans 5 through Romans 8 is this huge section on building hope built out of the justification that God has worked out for us in Jesus Christ. And and the all familiar passage that every biblical counselor knows and everybody's been accused of using falsely is Romans 8, 28 through 30, right? Turn over there if you haven't already. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. There's a lot of wisdom that needs to be exercised when we use this passage in counseling, especially in the midst of suffering. Next week I'll be at Charlotte, North Carolina, teaching a class at Reformed Theological Seminary on crisis and trauma counseling. And I break down that class into three segments. There's pre-trauma counseling, peri-trauma counseling, and post-trauma counseling. And when someone is in the midst, in the, in the depths of going through the trauma, a serious difficulty, an intense crisis, it is not always very helpful and encouraging to open up to Romans 8.28 and say, hey brother, this is all working out for your good and God's glory. The main thing that we need to do in the midst of, in the, in the, in the moments of suffering, in the moments of trauma, is to just be there. Just be there and and help and weep with those who weep. Nancy Guthrie has a great book called uh, What Grieving People Wish You Knew About What Helps and What Hurts or something along those lines. If you just Google something about that, you'll find it. And it's a great book where she just surveyed people going through all kinds of different trials and difficulties and traumas. And, And the main thing that she's in the midst, you just need to show up. It's what we would call the ministry of presence. There's the ministry of presence where we gift things that needs to people and then there's the ministry of just being there. At the Biblical Counseling Annual Leadership Summit, Paul Touches shared deeply from his own personal experience of raising, they have 10 kids and multiple have uh, disabilities and so some of the hardships and the suffering he gave in those talks five different things to hang your hat on in the midst of trauma. Just truths that you just need to remind people of these truths. God is there. He's with you. He loves you. He's good. And just pray with people. Remind them that he's, he's here. You're not alone. And I'm going to demonstrate that you're not alone by being here with you. But at some point in our counseling, we, we need to understand and we need to share with people this is a truth. That God is using all things in our lives for our good and his glory. But what is the good that Paul talks about here? How many of you have ever said something like this? Like, oh man, I spilled coffee on my shirt this morning and I had to go and change and I was driving to work. I realized there was a huge car accident at the intersection that I always go through and it was probably right, happened right when I would have been there if I hadn't changed my shirt. Praise God, he works all things for the good of his people and his glory, right? God is sovereign, he's providential. Yes, that's, that's awesome, that is good. But that's not the good that Paul is talking about here. Or what about this? The, the, I had a friend when I was in high school who she went to Moody Bible Institute and I don't remember what year, but it was I think my senior year in high school and she woke up one morning, had a heart attack, fell over and died. 18, 19 years old. Complications of starving herself to death and purging any food that she put into her system. And you ask, why God? She wanted to go on the mission field. What's the purpose in that? 
Her testimony has been phenomenal in reaching a lot of young ladies who struggle with those particular struggles and helping them see hope in Christ. And yes, that is a good that God is working, but that's, those kinds of stories are not always what Paul's talking about here. Well, actually, if people are coming to know Christ, it is what Paul's talking about here because this is what Paul's talking about. The good that he is working is not always manifested in some great thing that happens to a Christian down the road where you're able to, you ask the question why and then God tells you why later on. I don't know, we, we see the conversation with Satan and God before Job goes through trial, but I don't think we ever get to, Job ever gets to have the curtain drawn back and, and shown, hey, by the way, Job, this is what was going on. But this is what Paul tells us, the good that he is working is in verses 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The good that God is working through everything that happens in life, good or ill, from our perspective, is shaping us to be like Jesus. You understand that the word Christian means Christ-like. The, the whole the idea, think about the idea of the image of God throughout scripture and throughout human history. God created man in his own image and the, the, the Hebrew there is the, the idea of an icon, a statue that is formed and shaped in the exact image of, the, of a ruler. And rulers, what, what they would do is they would go out and they would conquer different lands and what they would do is they would set up a statue that looked just like them so that when they go back home to their capital, to their palace, everybody knows who is emperor here. Who is king here? It's that guy. I don't get to see him, but I see a picture of him right here in the statue. But what happened when we fell is that statue was toppled over off of the pedestal that it was on and it cracked and was spilled splattered into all kinds of pieces. The image of God is still there, it's just scattered all over, but when somebody comes to faith in Jesus Christ, that statue begins to get put back together. And the image of God gets built more and more and more in your life so that you begin to look less like you and more like Jesus. And that's the good that God is working in everything that happens in this life. So you being here today, you driving your car here this morning, the breakfast that you ate, the dinner that you had, the fact that you had lunch right after one hour of a session, all of that works together to make you like Jesus. How? I don't know every detail of it, but it does. Why? Because God's word said it does. So we exalt in sufferings because they produce good in us. We also exalt in our sufferings because God uses it to comfort others. God uses our suffering to comfort others. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that Purpose statement, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted by God. We can exalt in our tribulations because when God gives us comfort through those tribulations, we are equipped then to go and give comfort to other people who are in other situations. When, when I, I mentioned before, I work with veterans and active duty service members who are combat veterans. You want to talk about a tough nut to crack? You know, when, when, when we go to first, that's uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and says, no temptation is taking you except that which is common to man. You want to tell that to a guy who's seen his best friend obliterated by an IED or shot through the head by an ISIS bullet and he, you're going to tell him that your experience is just like everybody else's experience? No way. No way. 
The reality is, is that their temptation is not uncommon to man. It is common to man. Violence, warfare, combat has been something that has been prolific throughout human history. The reality is that the peace that we enjoy, relative peace that we enjoy in Western cultures now is, is the abnormal part of human history. But try to tell that to somebody who's been in combat. It's really tough. But it's not impossible. And what I, <clears throat> what I like to encourage people when, who, who are not combat veterans, who have the chance to minister to combat veterans, is don't let their combat or their experience be a, a wall that they put up to keep you from offering them truth. It might be very difficult. It might be, it might be impossible for you on your own to get over that wall. But all things are possible with God. And the reality is here, even though you haven't been in combat, even though you might not have ever seen somebody shot or killed anybody yourself, God has given you comfort in some trial. And Paul tells us there in 2 Corinthians that the comfort that God gave you can be used to comfort somebody in any affliction. Any affliction. So be courageous, be encouraged. You don't have to experience everything that everybody else has ever experienced in order to offer them counsel and truth because you're not giving your counsel and your truth. You're giving the everlasting, eternal truth of God. Now, if you are trying to rely on just your experience and just your wisdom and just your counsel, yeah, you're gonna blow it. You're not gonna be able to get over that wall, but the reality is, is you can take somebody here, you can take them to 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and tell them, I know this may sound hard for you to hear, God's word says that your temptation, the trial, the suffering, the difficulty that you're going through is, is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not tempt you beyond what you're able, but is faithful to provide you a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. And then you can take him to Psalm chapter six that David wrote and he describes his sleepless nights being up awake in the night, wandering around soaking his couch with tears. And that veteran who is wrestling with post-traumatic stress disorder is going to begin to connect with that story. And then you can tell him, by the way, that was written by one of the greatest warriors who has ever walked the earth. A man who faced down giants with a stone, a man who ripped lions apart with his bare hands, a man who, who mutilated the dead bodies of 2,000 of his enemy soldiers for his dowry. And he didn't do it through a scope or through a long distance rifle. He did it with a sword in his hand. No temptation has taken you except that which is common to man. And you don't have to have the exact experience of everybody who's ever counseled, but you can know that your suffering, your trial, your difficulties, the, the things that God has brought you through and the comfort that he has provided for you, you can exalt in those because they can be used by God to comfort and minister to others. We also exalt in our sufferings because in our weakness, the power of God is perfected. In our weakness, the power of God is perfected. Look at 2 Corinthians again, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Paul lists some difficulties and trials that he's gone through. Are, there servants, uh, are they servants of Christ? Paul's being attacked. He's being accused of being a false apostle by all these guys who are coming to Corinth. After Paul has established the church at Corinth, he's laid out his blood, he's spent his time, he's manufactured his tents and poured his life into these people. And then he's gone on to plant other churches and these, these false apostles are coming along saying, really, Paul, that guy? You want to follow him? Haven't you ever listened to him? He's kind of an idiot. He's not really great at speaking, and, and he, he doesn't really understand this, this, this Jesus stuff is a little off base. Remember the Old Testament? Remember that? We need, to, we need to continue to do those things that God called us to do in his law. 
And they're questioning him. And so Paul is addressing and, and confronting these accusations from these false teachers. And he says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if sane, as if insane. There's no way. You've got to be nuts if you think they're from Jesus. I more so. Far more la- in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received the lashes from the Jews, from the, received from the Jews, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I've been in frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, even without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Side note. Being a pastor is not easy. Pastors don't just work once a day, or once a week, one day a week. If, they, if they're faithful to the Lord and shepherding their flock, they work constantly. And even when they're not practically in front of another person or opening up God's word to study, the, the weight of the pressure of the concern for the church weighs on them heavily. And Paul says, look, beside, you think all that physical stuff was bad? You should think about what it's like inside my heart every single day as I think about all these churches and the hardships they're going through. He says it's far worse than being beaten and left for dead. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without an intense concern? Paul carries the the burdens of the people in his churches and in his soul. If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. Why? If you jump ahead to chapter 12, Paul lays out this vision that he had where he was lifted up and he saw the the third heaven and he sees God and he's prayed all these different times, said, Lord, remove this this thorn from my flesh. And God's answer is this. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. One of my favorite counseling times was a time where a husband and wife had come in for counseling. A lot of difficulty. One of them had discovered that the other was searching the internet for how to file for a divorce. And as you know, in counseling, things don't always go on an upward trajectory. We'd been meeting for a few weeks and things were on the decline and then all of a sudden vacations are coming up. <clears throat> and we're not going to be able to meet. And I think, I, I, I honestly remember leaving one session knowing that we weren't going to meet for a few weeks thinking, I'm not sure they're going to be married when I get back. And when I came back, it was amazing. Because things had completely turned on their head. The husband had completely turned around his behavior. He had been the most problematic one in the marriage. Not that the wife was without sin. But things had completely flipped and turned around where we were having to do kind of a Paul to the church at Corinth. Hey, hey, you need to remember to like receive him back. Like he's repented, he's turned away. You need to be rejoicing and, and encouraging and welcoming him back. And their, their marriage was brought back together and healed. And they were, years later, I got a great report about how they were doing, and it was phenomenal. And what did it, one of the things that reminded me is, is, Lord, you are the one who is at work in this, not me. When they were meeting with me, things were going pretty bad. But God's power is manifest in weakness. You think about some of the weak people in the, in the world and 
the, the amazing things that God does in and through them. The testimony, again, going back to First Peter, it's not when things are going great and you're strong and you're the person that everybody's looking to that people say, man, why do you have hope? It's when you're in your weakness that God's strength is manifest. <clears throat> You see, our, cal- our culture tells us that suffering is something that we should avoid at all costs. Abortion, the murder of unborn children, is approved and praised because we want to alleviate any potential mental suffering or hardship that a mom might face by having a child. The, the right to die or the right to end life whenever you choose or however you want to dress it up is pushed on us. Why? Why? It's not because people love death. It's because they are afraid of suffering. And they want to turn away from suffering. They don't don't actually see the value that suffering has. There are cultures now where, where children are being given the right to end their lives because of blindness and deafness and and mental anguish. It's not just terminal illness anymore. Why? Because we completely eradicated any idea that pain is gain and that suffering produces good things. So we must learn, we must learn to exalt in our tribulations, not to run away from them, but, but how? First, I want us to talk about how we can, what we should hope for. So we should hope for the purposes of God. See, most times people hope for a change in circumstance. That's what they're looking for, right? Like we mentioned with Carl, he doesn't want, he wants his family back. He wants his wife to love him. He wants his kids to behave. You know, people come in and say, fix my, my marriage. It's her problem, right? She, she's the problem. If you just fix her, I'll be okay. And she's sitting there saying, no, if, he's, if you just fix him, everything will be okay. Take away the bad thoughts, make my wife behave, do whatever it is to do, but my hope is that everything will be better when you change the circumstances. One of the, one of the best ways to do this is just start asking questions of people. Saying, what is it, you know, if, if, if you could hit an easy button, I don't know if you guys have Staples, that store here in Canada, but in, in the States they have that stupid easy button. <laughs> like, push that and everything works. And just tell people, if you had an easy button to push, and you could change one thing or anything about your life right now, what, what would it be? What would make your life perfect? That question is going to reveal in their heart what they are longing for. What are they hoping for? What is the change that they are seeking that, that is driving them to counsel? It doesn't have to be that exact one, but something along those to reveal the desires of the heart because the desires are, are going to be played out in the beliefs and the behaviors of what people are, how people are living But what happens is if somebody is putting their trust and their hope for something in in something like circumstance is it's unsound footing because circumstances are going to change and there's no guarantee that that circumstance will change the way that they want it to change. If you've ever gone hiking or, or, or you can imagine it pretty easily if you imagine walking across a river on stones, uh, if, let me just give you a piece of advice. Don't just jump from one to another. You kind of want to put your foot on it and test it to see if it's going to give way or not. And if you, if you hit a stone and you're wiggling it and it's wiggling like this, you probably don't want to step both feet on it and put all of your trust in that thing. But that's exactly what we do when we put our hope on circumstance. Instead, we want to put our hope on God, the, un, the unchanging, certain, steadfast, never-ending, faithful God. And we want to hope for God's purposes, not ours. It's like, anybody ever see Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade? That, that last scene where he's kind of going through the temple and he gets to that floor that has all these letters and all these stones, Right? And, and it's in Latin, so he missteps and he puts his hole through the floor and you realize if he steps on the wrong thing, it's completely unsupported. He's gonna fall through to his death. And what are the stones that he has to step on? It's, it's, it's ironic and it's a helpful illustration. It's God's name, right? In Latin, so he misspells the first letter. Um, 
But that's what we do. Is when he when Indiana is walking on God's name, he is on firm ground and firm footing, and his hope is not shaken. It's not uncertain. It has that that certain expectation of the future, that trust and that waiting for something to happen. The reality is that circumstances will change, but more often than not, they're not gonna get better. They're gonna get worse, right? Amen, everybody who's over 25, right? I don't know, like, it seems like life goes on this, this hill upward and then there's a tipping point at some point and then it, I think I've gotten to that tipping point because like my body started falling apart when I turned 35. It was just, I'd never had a surgery in my life in the last three years. It's been boom, boom, boom. I'm like, what in the world happened? I mean, think about it. And, and, and I've wanted to think about this for a while with, with uh, counseling elderly people if our hope is built on how much scripture somebody can memorize, and I'm all about memorizing scripture, as somebody ages or starts to experience dementia or Alzheimer's, if our hope is on how much scripture they can memorize and recite back to us, then, then we're, we're up a creek without a paddle. The circumstances often are not going to get better. They're often going to get worse. So if we're putting our hope for our purposes on circumstances to improve we're gonna be disappointed. We're gonna be more distressed. We're gonna be more despairing. The reality is sometimes suffering compounds other suffering. And some suffering will not end until this life is over. Back in December, I mentioned that we had our BCC annual leadership summit. So we have this gathering of our council board, which is about 60 of the world's leading biblical counselors. And we get them together for a three-day summit in December. <clears throat> This past December, we had Johnny Erickson Tata, Ken uh, Tata, and a team from Johnny and Friends join us. If you, if you know Johnny, then you know where I'm going with this. If you don't, I'll give you a little background. Johnny Erickson Tata is the oldest living re- quadriplegic on record. She's been in a wheelchair, unable to move anything, very much of her arms or hands or her legs for 50 years. When she was 17, she dove into shallow water, fractured her spine, was face down in the water, going to drown, and her sister happened to be bit by a crab on the toe under this lake water, which caused her to turn around and see Johnny floating face down in the water. And she quickly got her up, uprighted and to medical care. And Johnny was a believer. She believed in Jesus Christ, but she went from this athletic, angelic voice, talented young woman to a person who couldn't move at all. Her, her story's been put into film and she's become this world famous person who advocates for disability people but also proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she is the, probably the greatest picture I've ever known of somebody who suffers with joy. And, and Johnny's story didn't end with quadriplegia. She, she uh, about a decade or so ago, ended up with cancer. And she has to constantly wrestle with bed sores and, and chronic pain. And, and people ask, Why, how can a quadriplegic have chronic pain? And they're like, I don't know, but there's something that works still there that makes it hurt. And she told me in December that there's some new complications, that just being that alive for that long with the inability to move your body just compounds complication after complication after complication. And anybody who's been with Johnny for any amount of time knows that she is saturated with joy. One uh, well-known biblical counselor told me, he said, I think she is more like Jesus than any other person I've ever met in my entire life because of the, the refiner's fire that she has been put through. And Johnny will tell you, not every day is a, a good day. She has moments of despair, moments of wishing it was all over. There were times early on where she tried to convince friends to help her commit suicide. There are still times where she cries out, Lord, take me home. But she knows that for her to live is Christ and to die is gain. And she's looking forward to that gain, but she's also used by, by God to, to gain so much for the kingdom. 
But the point is her hope, that her joy doesn't come from the hope that somehow she'll be able to get out of that wheelchair at some point. That's never gonna happen until eternity. Her hope is in the purposes of God and understanding that what God, that God uses all things for the good of those who love him and who are in his own glory. Besides the fact that things tend to get worse, we're promised that as human history moves along further, it's going to get worse. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1, look, in the end times, things are gonna get a whole lot worse than they are before they get better. My wife hates this idea, but it's true and it, it, it's important to think about that life is this constant cycle where you're either in a suffering, heading into one, or coming out of one, right? Now, I don't want to minimize or take away from those blessed, glorious times where things tend to be going pretty well and praise the Lord, they come and they're awesome, enjoy them when they come, but the reality is, is we can still exult in our tribulations and there are plenty of opportunities to exult, Amen. The trick is not to long for the end of the suffering, but to exalt in the midst of it. How do, we, how do we rejoice and have peace amidst the storm? So what should we hope for? We're not setting our hope on the purposes of circumstances changing or our purposes. We're putting our, purpose, our hope on the purposes of God. So we hope for God's purpose in our lives, which is to Glorify him. What is the chief end of man, all you Westminster confession people? <laughs> to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Or as Piper changed it, to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Either way you put it, the point is we glorify God, right? That's our purpose. Romans eleven thirty six: For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You, remember, you realize that when you ordered breakfast this morning, whether you had oatmeal or a Belgian waffle and 500,000 calories of fried meat, it either was glorifying to God or it wasn't. I'm not gonna name names. I'm not judge, here to judge. Um, I was the guy with the, the bacon and the waffle. <clears throat> and I wish there was ice cream on top. No. Um, <laughs> But the reality, everything that we do in life can be done for God's glory and that's our purpose. That's what we're here for. So we need to put our hope in that because the reality is if we hope for the glory, God to be glorified, our hopes will be satisfied because God will be glorified. He's made it clear that even in the destruction of, of vessels that were created for destruction, he is glorified. When Pharaoh's heart was hardened, by God and by Pharaoh working together in some mysterious way and Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea and all of his army with him, God was glorified. When Jesus was lifted up on the cross and he died, he was buried, and he rose again, God was glorified. When you ate breakfast this morning, whether it was the oatmeal or the 5,000 calories of fried meat, God was glorified. The question is whether or not the decisions, the thoughts, the desires of our hearts are cooperating with that glory and magnifying it more or God's being glorified in spite of our works. So in Romans 5 verses 3 through 4, that progression that trials and tribulations work in our lives is also known as sanctification. Sanctification. So early on when you're counseling, you need to help people establish what their true goals should be. You need to help them realize that you're not there to fix their marriage and neither should they be. You're there to help them glorify God whether their marriage comes back together or not. Because each person, husband and wife, can seek to choose and follow after God independent of the other and, and both won't always choose to do it together. And if your goal is, is fixing their marriage, you're gonna be frustrated and they're gonna be frustrated. Your goal is to seek the glory of God no matter what happens in the circumstances of this life. So one of the things you can help people do to help what, ask whether or not their, their, their purposes, their hope is for God's purposes or for their own is instead of asking why God in the midst of their circumstances, have them start asking what God? 
What is it that you're working in my life? Why did you let this happen? Not with a fist in the face, but with an open hand willing to receive. What are you doing in my life? What are you wanting to teach me, Lord? Brings us to the third point, hope in the purposes of God. And I am quickly running out of time. We can hope in the purposes of God, <clears throat> but this is not generic purpose. I just, wanna, I just wanna highlight the fact that lots of people think all, everything happens for a purpose, right? I was listening to an interview with a young lady a little while ago who's going through a, a physical, she has a physical disability, and I don't know if she was a believer or not, but it, did, it wasn't clear from what she was talking about, but she said, I just believe that everything happens for a purpose. Everything happens for a reason. There are lots of people who believe that, that have no idea why there's purpose. But purposes don't just come out of nowhere. Something or someone must establish a purpose. And if you set your hope on the idea that everything happens for some good reason, but there's nothing to dictate what that reason is or to bring that reason about, you're still hopeless. You're just delusional. You have no reason for hope. But when we put our hope, hope in the purposes of God, they will come about. We have to change our, our focus from focusing on getting what I want to what God wants. Because the reality is if we're just focused on getting what I want and getting a happy life and pursuing the things that I want here and now, we will be disappointed because Jesus tells us, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So here's some, just some practical application I want to give you as we move on today. The first is that we need to prepare ourselves for suffering. Prepare yourselves for suffering. Richard Baxter is a, a guy who uh, a lot of seminary students will know because they have to read the book called The Reformed Pastor, and this guy wrote like nobody's business. J.I. Packer said that nothing else ne ever needs to be written on biblical counseling because Baxter already wrote it all. He wrote, I mean, if you get the collected works of Baxter, it's 23 volumes. This is just massive. And he was writing in the time of the English Civil War, so he, he was actually not Puritan, and then he was Puritan, depending on uh, seasons of his life, and, and, and he was on both sides of the conflict, depending on who was winning during the Civil War. This is a time where if you were on the wrong side of the winning battle, the, the least bad thing that they would do to you is slice your nostrils open and slit your tongue to a forked tongue. They would torture pastors by pulling their joints out of joint and putting them back in just so they could be pulled out again the next day. Imprisoned, killed, all these horrendous things. He was an army chaplain for a while in the midst of the Civil War. He saw great suffering. And he reminded people throughout his teaching that scripture tells us we are going to suffer. So we should expect it. That's what Peter says why are you surprised by this fiery trial that you're enduring? Didn't you, didn't you remember what Jesus said? If the world hated me, they're gonna hate you. Expect to suffer because if you don't expect to suffer, when suffering comes, you're gonna be disappointed, you're gonna be frustrated. You're gonna have a hard time dealing with life. This is what happens that results in what's, what the secular world will call cognitive dissonance, right? It's when reality, the things that I believe about reality come in conflict with the reality of the world and my mind can't handle that. Something has to give. Either I'm gonna crack or I'm gonna change my belief and I might change my belief to ditch what I believed about God if I thought that God was just gonna make everything good and great and awesome in my life. And that becoming a Christian was going to smooth the way for my life and it was going to be all better and all my, my friends would not get sick and my family members wouldn't get sick and everybody would be happy and get along. If that's what I believe the Christian life is about, reality is going to conflict with that. So we must teach ourselves to expect suffering. My pastor, I told him the other day, because he was teaching about just the reality that we're going to be there, and my eight-year-old sitting in the service, and I told my pastor, I said, I love you because you're helping inoculate my son against PTSD. And he's like, what are you talking about? And, and I, 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 there's a whole lot more to say about that, but the reality is if people understand that suffering is going to happen and they face suffering, they're a lot less likely to experience the, the symptoms that we would call post-traumatic stress disorder. 
This one's a little harder. But pre- prefer suffering. Prefer suffering. And I don't, I'm not gonna belabor this point and I don't wanna, I do wanna remind you I said we're not masochists so I'm not saying just choose suffering for suffering's sake. Suffering is going to come. And all things being equal between your choices, if you have a choice to do something that's gonna lead to great suffering and one that's not, I don't think it's sinful to choose a thing that's gonna avoid the suffering. It might be and you need to weigh carefully what those things are. But let me ask you this. In your own life, in your own experience, when were the times that you grew the most? When everything was hunky-dory, right? No. God, use it. Paul doesn't say exalt in the, the joy is great times because they produce character which produces perseverance which produces hope. No, he says the tribulations do that. And if you need any more reminding about preferring suffering, just think about the greatest single act of wickedness and torture and evil that has ever happened in all of history, the cross of Jesus Christ. And through that greatest execution, false murder of an innocent man, the greatest good that has ever worked ever in all of human history, all of history in its entirety, all of the universe was accomplished through the worst act ever. The greatest point of suffering and trauma that ever anybody ever went through resulted in the redemption of the souls of God's people. We need to prefer suffering. We also need to practice suffering. Practice suffering. I would just encourage you to, to, part, to, to enjoy and participate and exalt in the practices of the human, of the Christian tradition, things like fasting and self-denial. When Paul says, I, I have beaten my body so that I might, might, might not be disqualified, that's not really, you know, it's not, he's not beating himself with a loofah. <laughs> it's, he's preparing himself for trials. When we fast or we practice other forms of denial, we are curbing our appetites for the things of this world and we're learning to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It ensures that we love God for who he is and not just the good things that he does for us. It affirms to us that our hope does not rest in creation. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We are not sustained by the creation, but the creator. And enter into suffering with other people. Practice suffering with one another. If you've gotten into counseling and you have this idea that somehow the relationship between a counselor and the person getting counseled is some distant, sterile, removed relationship, you do not know what scripture says about counseling because Paul said in Acts 20, verse 31, he says, therefore be on the alert remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. You know the word compassion means to suffer with somebody? We get confused because in passion, when we talk about passion these days, it's all about Things that we love and super intense love and that guy's just so passionate because he feels deeply. The passion of the Christ is not the deep intense feelings that Jesus had for us. The passion of the Christ was the suffering that he faced going to and through the cross. And compassion is entering into that suffering with somebody else, truly weeping with those who weep. And we must practice suffering together as the body of Christ. That's why counseling, I, I, there are lots of manifestations of biblical counseling around the world. I do a podcast once a week and I have the opportunity to talk with people about how they flesh out biblical counseling in helping women get out of strip clubs or helping pastors who've been thrown out of their church or uh, rehab centers for people who struggle with substance abuse. But the best place for biblical counseling to take place is always in the local church. Why? Because counseling, discipleship, true life change doesn't come because I sit across from a desk for you for one hour a week and we never see each other ever again. 
True, the best discipleship, the best life change is gonna happen when brother and sister and brother and brother and sister and sister are walking together hand in hand through the suffering of life, seeing each other week in and week out at the grocery store, in the pew, singing songs with each other at the nursery room, picking up our kids together, patting each other on the back. How are you doing? Phone calls, emails, texts, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you do, like be together. As the church, I mean, just think about the fact that we don't often sing songs of lament anymore. We don't like to suffer together. Because we don't like to suffer. We don't see the value in it. We don't see the purposes that God is working out through his suffering, but we need to do it together, people. The Psalms are songs that were written to be sung together in the congregation of God, and the majority of them deal with hard things. And I'm thankful for the new Christian songwriters that for a while, and, and, and many old ones, I mean, It Is Well With My Soul was not written in a joyous time. But we've gone through seasons in the church where we are unwilling to sing things because that might make people feel bad. I'm here to get my spiritual boost for the week and I need to get pep talk to get zapped up to go for the next week while I get drained to get zapped up again. That is not the body of Christ. <clears throat> so Carl, just like all of our other counselees, we needs to have his desires, his goals, his plans, his hopes for the counseling and his life to come in alignment with God's word. Carl wants his memories to go away. He wants to stop drinking and he wants his marriage to be right again and we want those things as well. And there's nothing wrong with seeking those things but there is no guarantee they're going to happen. Those things are not certain to come about so we must not set our feet or Carl's feet on the unsteady ground of hoping for and hoping in circumstances to change. We want to plant our feet securely and on the sure and steady ground of God's purposes. And in doing so, we equip ourselves and Carl and everybody else we minister to exalt in their tribulations. Dear Lord, I pray that you would add the blessing, your blessing to these words. Amen.